hands. How many of you know what the census is? Okay, good amount, but we still need to improve that within our community. Uh, but do we have an amazing panel today that I'll introduce in a second, but I want to hand it off right now to uh, Mr. Nick Kuwata, who is the manager who handles the Office of the Census for Santa Clara County. Like going on a Saturday, what about the census, right? <laughs> and, uh, I can't, I can't. But I'm really glad to see the engagements at this level to this degree here in this county. Now, my background is in community involvement, uh, civic leader. Uh, my whole upbringing was under the tutelage of Richard Connor, who taught me that it's not enough to just help ourselves and to get us into a comfortable place. We then must reach back into the community and help people behind us, the people who need the help as well. And census is a primary motive for that. All my years of community involvement uh, didn't mean very much if we weren't training back around and helping those behind us. So we really need civic engagement. We need it now. And I see the census not, uh, I mean, maybe my colleagues disagree, but not only as a barrier and this tough thing to handle and this thing that we, we want to run away from, but an opportunity to engage communities that we have not traditionally engaged, the undocumented, international students, people who are all supposed to be counted for the census. This is not an us them thing. This is an everybody in it together thing. Um, so I want to uh, talk very, very briefly, and I only have two slides about why the census matters. So as everybody knows, under Article 1, Section 2, Constitution says, everyone shall be counted for, the, for two major purposes. The very first one, and why it's in the Constitution, is political power. We have two houses in, the, in, in representation in, in, uh, in Congress, right? The U.S. House of Representatives and the Senate. Senate, we don't get to choose, right? You get two, that's it, man. For the U.S. House of Representatives, we have 435 representatives, right? That number is capped. Sorry, no more included after that, okay? Because of that number, we actually have a zero-sum game ahead of us in 2020. For every person not counted, counts against our population count, and therefore decreases the amount of representation that we have. Where are the low likely places where we're going to be undercounted? Here in California. Where are we going to lose seats? Here in California. So this is our opportunity to, to, in a very divided time, to make sure that we have the adequate representation of political power in this 2020 census. So directly about political power, this is, you know, aside from voting, the most important aspect of it, okay? Remember, folks, census only comes once every 10 years. You do not get a second try. The second thing is funny. We get about, about $675 billion, and yes, that is with the capital B billion, distributed annually from the federal government. And to be honest with you, a lot of these, um, sorry, oh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, a lot of these, uh, a lot of the money uh, contained in that is actually pretty conservative. All the safety net programs that we need for our communities, they all come from the census. Food stamps, Medi-Cal, Section 8 housing, uh, roads, school lunches, school funding. I think it's very appropriate that we have it here today at Santa Clara County's Office of the Education uh, to talk about the census. Because one of the most hardest institutions will be education, which I, I tend to believe is a pretty big AAPI issue, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> so uh, that's really what this census is and why it's important. I'm going to hand it over to Ed. Thank you so much. But uh, as you already know, Nick Kuwata, uh, I'm on next to introduce Nellie Madsen from uh, the United Way Bay Area. She's the Senior Vice President for Community Impact. And then we have Ann Pim. She's the Program Officer for Immigration-Related uh, Programming at the Silicon Valley Community Foundation and heading up the census-related issues. They're both heading up their respective census-related issues. And then you all remember Dr. Data at the very end. <laughs> so uh, I think we're going to start off real quickly with uh, a video from the Silicon Valley Community Foundation. And we'll let him work his magic.
work that out. <laughs> As the Brady Bunch scene pops up there. <laughs> Half the room probably does not understand that reference now. <laughs> Maybe we can go around uh, the, the panel and ask, why is the census important to you? Uh, so, oh, I should press the yellow real quick. Uh, okay, uh, so I, I actually am going to pass it to my colleagues because I think I have my my first. Hi everyone. Um, I think personally, I, this is new to me. I've never worked on the census before. I just I just started doing this earlier this year to apply for the role that we got, which I'll talk about later. But um, I think for me, it's been about. I, I don't know if I can. I, I don't know. I, I'm not speaking for United Way. I'm speaking for myself, and it's sort of not letting them win. Um, having this that every person belongs and every person matters and every person counts. And to me, the census um, is a way we can do that. So um, Nick talked a little bit earlier about political representation and funding, which are two really important reasons for why the census is important. Um, but for me personally, um, as an immigrant and someone working on immigration issues, uh, I see census as sort of the social justice issue of 2020. And to me, participating in the census uh, during this time where many immigrants are under attack, both documented and undocumented, and immigrants don't necessarily feel that they're welcome here in this country, I feel like census for me uh, personally is, is an act of um, humanity it's an act of courage and an act of resistance. To be able to say that I'm here, and I'm a part of this community, and I count. And um, the census is a count of all people. The Constitution says it's everyone. It doesn't say whether you have citizenship or a green card or any sort of documentation. Every person must be counted. And so the frame in which I'm thinking about it, um, personally, and why I care so much, is, is in some ways sort of my form of saying I matter. And I hope that other people who are feeling during this sort of time of, um, of stress and sort of this anti-immigrant rhetoric and policy, I hope they also feel the same way. So to follow up with that, I mean, uh, the context you earlier mentioned there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of apprehension in the community people that when you look in the Luca community that don't want to participate within the census. What are you hearing from the ground, what are you, uh, within the communities, uh, whether it be API or maybe from the larger community? Oh, Any, anyone? Yeah. Okay, so um, I think the, the number one thing is there are particular challenges with this census that we have not faced ever before. Um, and, and I left it off, which is like 98% of the, the other slides that I, we have are talking about the barriers. The very first is, this will be, for the most part, a majority digital census. So um, I think most folks in the room who've done the census before were used to getting something in the mail and saying, hey, fill this thing out, and turn it in. Uh, sorry, folks, that's not the game this time around. You are going to get a mail, and it's going to say, sometime in March, by the way, at the same time we have early primaries going on, so I hope you watch your mail very carefully, saying, okay, person in this household, I want you to go to this website, put in this unique identifier, and then you can fill it out online. Now, for most of us, that's gonna be fine, especially here in Silicon Valley. I think a lot of us are like, oh, I've got a phone, I've got a you know, laptop or whatever. Um, I can fill it out. But there's a majority of, there's a large majority of us, especially uh, within our API community, who do not have ready access or the technological literary skills to access computers in a meaningful way to then fill it out online. Um, the other issue is the online form will be in 12 non-English languages. The paper form, the one that most of our communities are used to, will only be in Spanish and English. That's it. Um, the other problem is, uh, you know, there's going to also be a possible citizenship question on this thing. And for a lot of communities who have recently faced, um, you know, very anti-immigrant rhetoric, uh, even policies of being removed from this country based on um, status, I think uh, that's a very frightening thing. Yeah, I would echo um, what Nick has shared. Um, and I even think about myself and going online. You know, you could sit there with your piece of paper. Maybe you answer a question. Maybe one of them's confusing. You can go look it up. You can, you know, think about it. You can make sure you grab the other. You know, if you have a multifamily household or if you have 
um, non-family households, you might need to find out some of that information. Um, and now it's in one sitting online, you know, like it's just gonna be really different, I think, than how we've done the census before. So um, in addition to all the access issues, um, and then the not in, in your language, and I know that um, that there's, I don't even know the number of languages in the Bay Area, but it certainly is not um, 13. And so we have a lot of work to do to, to get people the information they need to be able to do it. And then the, the fear and distrust um, generally, um, of course from the citizenship question, but in general um, of government by immigrants, by, uh, by everyone almost right now. Um, so the idea that you know, I don't really trust the government with my information and how am I gonna go in there and do that? Um, and, and especially if you're not convinced on the importance and you're not convinced on the, the impact that it will have if, you're, um, if we're not counted. So if you don't have all that information, you know, someone didn't get to you, I just feel like you might, you know, it could be lower on your list of what's, uh, what's to do. Um, I mean, I think for me, what I hear mostly from all communities is the fear and distrust of government. Um, so as the program officer managing our immigration strategy at the foundation, we provide grants to nonprofit organizations throughout Santa Clara County and San Mateo County who are serving immigrants. And um, sort of two things came to mind with Edwin's question. The first is that a lot of our service providers have been doing uh, Know Your Rights workshops and have been educating the community about what their rights are. And they've been passing out red cards, basically saying, you know, you don't have to open the door, right, if ICE knocks on your door. And so one of the challenges sort of that they're faced with is how we message the census now. So it's like, you know, you have your rights, you don't have to open your door, but then it's like, if it's a census enumerator, we want you to open the door because we need to be counted. Um, so, you know, I think that's, uh, the messaging around that I think is a challenge that some of our service providers are thinking through and still haven't figured out what the answer is to yet. The second thing, um, Karthik had earlier mentioned the pu proposed public charge ruling. Um, and essentially, you know, uh, if you're applying for a visa or a green card, the U.S. government looks at a couple different factors. Um, I guess the simplest way to say it is, for the most part, it's mostly cash, currently cash benefits, right? Like so it's supplemental security income. But there is a current proposal out right now um, that is being considered to really expand um, uh, consideration to include many non-cash benefits like Medi-Cal or housing vouchers. And this is a huge issue right now that's going on in our community um, because immigrants are very fearful that if they use any sort of public benefit that it's somehow going to count against them. Um, and so what we're hearing on the ground is our service providers are working with community members here in our county who are saying, I don't wanna utilize these benefits. Um, some are even saying I use these benefits in the past is there any way to just scrub my name from the record entirely because I just don't want any sort of association with having used these benefits. Um, we are also hearing that um, many people are confused about this. Uh, so there are immigrants who are eligible for these benefits and they're not actually accessing them for fear of what might happen in the future. And this is actually just a proposal. This is, has not actually gone into effect. So how that relates to the census is pe people are afraid. They're afraid to give information out to the government. They're afraid to participate in any sort of survey or questionnaire that might identify them as being undocumented um, and sort of seeing how the government could potentially connect dots, even though under Title 13, this information is protected and cannot be shared with other federal agencies. So we're hearing from a lot of nonprofit organizations that these are sort of the concerns that they're um, hearing from the clients that they serve. And um, it's, it's, it's a huge, it's gonna be a big lift to make sure everyone's counted. Definitely, and I think, you know, the issue is even if you are a citizen, you may have a mixed status family or household in which you might have an undocumented person in your family or a green card holder and you don't wanna put them at risk as well. And to kind of follow up uh, on maybe another factor with the Bay Area, affordable housing is almost a complete myth or a unicorn. So how does the multiple families that are sitting, staying in one household might affect the census count? 
Well, you know, the census data, um, it's not shared with landlords, right? So it's protected. However, the reality of, you know, our Bay Area uh, living situation is that you have two, three, four households living in one apartment or one home. And people don't necessarily want to share all of that information on a census form because they might not know that that information can't be shared with a landlord. Um, they, may, they might fear eviction. And um, so that's a big issue. Another one is that we have a lot of families who are living in garages, in um, RVs, who are living in in-law units. Um, they may be separate from the household in the main, living in the main house, but they too must be counted. And so making sure that they're also included is a challenge because um, you know people, people don't necessarily want to share that they're living in a garage unit. So this is gonna be a huge issue because if you think about the last 10 years, housing prices have just gone up even more than you know they were in 2010. Um, I don't know. Add one other thing is if there is also a misconception that once that form is in, then you're you're done. <laughs> uh, households that are all grouped together can send in multiple census forms, and then they can all be counted. So don't worry if you get missed. Uh, we still want you to fill out another census form. You can do the census on on the phone too if you want to, and talk to somebody and you fill out that information as well. It can be supplemented. I mean, ideally, it'd be great to have everyone in one form, but listen, that's a Census Bureau's problem. That's not ours, so let's make sure that we all get counted. So there's obviously a lot of hurdles, a lot of barriers going forward with the Census. And we know the importance of it. But what are some strategies that each of your organizations are taking to actually outreach not only to the maybe API specific, but maybe to all the hard-to-count communities? Um, so maybe I'll, I'll take lead on this one. So, um, Karthika, I got bad news for you. The Complete Count Committee is step one in a billion-step process. <laughs> Uh, so, I mean, I, I love the idea that people get together with their complete count committees, but that's really where we started. Um, and it really actually started even before that with the local update of census addresses, which happened in 2018. Aggie was a huge partner in that, along with a number of our organizations who are here today as well, so thank you. Uh, but adding the number of addresses to the master address file so those folks would even know that the census is coming uh, was important. But then getting that engagement. So Santa Clara County invested an unprecedented uh, amount of money, over $2 million in this project for uh, county, and county alone in outreach. So the base formula for best practices on the Census Bureau's auspices is this thing called the Complete Count Committee. Ours here is called the SC5, just because no one wants to say Santa Clara County Complete Count Committee over and over again. So it's the SC5. We have 10 different uh, subcommittees focused on different hard to count communities. If you are a student, if you are an organization that's not already involved, I highly encourage you walk out to our table. Monica, can you please raise your hand out in their back? She uh, actually is asking folks to get uh, their contact information for pledges around the census, putting your thumbprint on, on map, showing your sphere of influence. And we want as many of your, uh, your hands on that as possible. So there are real ways you can get involved with those subcommittees, talk to hard to count populations, and the three of us as funding partners to, to coordinate all our efforts around the census. Everything from messaging, identifying messengers, coverage, targeting formulas, everything. We're, we're doing it all together. Great. There, real quick, because there's a lot of jargon right there. Uh, so what are hard to count communities? <laughs> oh, or yeah, I probably should explain my job. Uh, so <laughs> hard, hard to count communities are, uh, you know, it's funny. When we talk about voters, we say, oh, they're just not a very likely to vote person. But hard to count communities is a really, really broad subject. You could be, uh, you know, the, the number one undercounted population for the census is zero to five year olds. Uh, you could be English as a second language speaker. You know, you could be, uh, you know, you have mobility access issues. All these ideas can really make it harder for you to, and less likely respond to the census, therefore making you hard to count. But immigrants, yeah. Immigrants, yeah. Immigrants, yeah. Immigrants, yeah. Immigrants, yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> about the community that's just like Muslims, you know, out of Asia, you know. Absolutely. And California is about 75%, you know, hard to count. So they fall in one or more of those categories. So we have a big job ahead. Um, in terms of our role and what we're going to do, uh, the United Way was selected as the administrative community-based organization by the state. So the state has, has invested $90 million in ensuring a complete count. And, part, and so they've given the counties money, and then they also 
with these regional organizations, 10 of them across the state, um, to be just sort of an extra helping hand. Most of, mostly their job is to get money out in the community uh, to our trusted messengers and other community-based organizations, but to also collaborate and coordinate with the counties in their region. So for us, we're region three, and we are coordinating with all of, with seven of the Bay Area counties, um, including Santa Clara County and San Mateo County. And, um, but the only one that's not, or two that we normally think about as Bay Area counties, um, they're not in our list, are Napa and Sonoma, they're part of another uh, region. So we're charged with getting, like I said, doing some grant making and subcontracting and getting money out to um, local organizations. We actually have an RFP we just released um, a couple weeks ago. And if you go to our website at uwba.org slash census, you can find the application there. It's due June 28th. And so we are looking for applications and um, want to fund projects happening locally that are you know, with communities or organizations that know communities and are in touch with communities and know how to encourage them to take the census and work with them to do that. Um, we're also doing some direct coordination ourselves um, I'm sorry, not direct coordination, direct outreach. Um, so we'll be purchasing you know, ads, we'll be, we're creating a campaign toolkit that we're hoping all the counties will use. Um, Santa Clara County and San Mateo County, um, but Santa Clara County, since we're here with Santa Clara, is such a model uh, for the whole state. Um, as soon as I started working on this, I heard about the great work that the county was doing and you should know that you're in good hands, um, but that doesn't mean you can sit back and relax, but that means that um, you have great leadership and a lot of opportunity ahead of us. Um, but the Bay Area has some counties like Solano County, um, where we is severely under-resourced, right? So as this ACBO for seven counties, we're trying to make sure that the, everyone sort of has this baseline of support. Um, and then I would just add that the, the regional coordination role is probably one of the bigger pieces in addition to grant making that you know, working with the funders and the funder collaborative, working with the counties. Um, we have a monthly meeting or call where we are trying to tackle issue by issue. It feels like we're just getting started, even though I know so many have done so much work um, already and we have a lot of work ahead of us. But um, a lot of that coordination and collaboration on things, I think is gonna be really key. Um, like Nick mentioned, I'm hoping we can all look at, you know, these applications are gonna come through. The, the funders collaborative had their applications due on the 31st. I'm hoping the counties are about to release some RFPs, so I'm hoping we can all make sure that we have the coverage across populations, across uh, geography, to make sure that there's, you know, we haven't missed anything, that, that all of the strategies that we know would work, that we've put it on the table and we put everything into it. So that's really um, United Way's role. Um, we're hiring a person um, to be our census director, and that person will be here soon, and I'm really excited about that, and um, not because I'm busy or anything. <laughs> But I do have some other stuff that I have to do at work, um, but census has been such an exciting piece of the work I've gotten to do for the last few months. But um, I hope you'll go to uwba.org slash census. I think right now it's focused on the application, but I think as we evolve, we're hoping it's sort of a hub for resources for you as activists and as um, trusted messengers that you can go there and find information. At Silicon Valley Community Foundation, we have a four-pronged strategy for our census work. The first is around policy advocacy. So the proposed citizenship question was mentioned. It's currently being considered in the Supreme Court. We're hoping to hear some result by the end of this month. Um, we signed on to an amicus brief to oppose it, um, and we have been advocating um, aggressively to make sure that it doesn't get on the form. Uh, we are also doing uh, a lot of work around both earned and paid media. So the video that I don't think um, we had some technical difficulties with was the video that we just put together um, uh, in, in staff uh, advocating for people to participate in the census. Um, we have this article, um, you can pick it up out on the registration table where the name tags are. We're doing newsletters, we've done podcasts, like every sort of internal resource that we can use to spread the word about census, we're doing that. Um, the third is around training for nonprofits. We just uh, hosted a one on digital strategy. Uh, remember that in 2010, we did not have Facebook or Instagram um, or Twitter. So this is a new day here for the census. And if we are to, um, as Kelly said, win, we need to make sure that we have a strong social media and digital strategy. Um, and that, I know there's a lot of young people in this room. I hope that you plan to make videos and post 
because we need to get the word out to make sure that people know that the census is important. And then finally, grant making is our last um, strategy. We just closed an RFP um, and have received applications. We will be funding nonprofits throughout um, uh, the county to support this work. We will be funding uh, nonprofits serving the API community, and we need to make sure that everyone in, in, in our community is involved. Because it's this is an all hands on deck effort. And to the students in the room, think about any of those companies you can coordinate with in your schools, whether a hospital wants to get uh, DASD funding to, to put towards the census. We have the superintendent here for all the ASHA students in Santa Clara County. You can talk to her and advocate for some money, right? But as she gives me a weird laugh, but yes, <laughs> she's very committed to this type of issue. So she is amazing. They, they have an amazing county office here. But this is not to date you, Anne. I know you were very active in the 2010 census. Uh, what tactics worked then to actually improve the outcomes? This is actually my third census. I started when I was a baby. <laughs> People are like, third census? Yes, this is actually, I worked on the 2000 census too. But in, in 2010, when I worked at Aki, we did a lot of on the ground outreach in San Jose. And um, honestly, you know, in reaching a very hard to count population, we were primarily focused on the Southeast Asian and Spanish speaking populations. It was really one on one interactions that, that, that got people to feel left out. So we were talking to people who were undocumented, talking to families who um, were not sure what this information would be used for. And it was a lot of conversations, um, knocking on doors, getting people to come out to census parties. We had to make it fun. We have to, we gotta make the census fun, okay? This is, this is something where people just can ignore it easily, but it's so consequential. So we got people out, we had food, we had educational um, uh, workshops, and again, we had food, right? Because food brings people <laughs> together. That brings our community together. And we invited the US Census Bureau and partnered with them to make presentations alongside our staff who were the trusted messengers in the community to be able to tell our, our community this matters and this is why. And I think you have to make sure that you're having those one-on-one -on -one interactions and conversations with people and get people to really think about it. Um, one of the things that I've been you know, referencing as an example is this sort of scene from My Big Fat Greek Wedding. Has that, have you all seen that movie? It's an old movie. There's a great scene in there where the father's in the car with the kids, and he says, give me a word, any word, and I will show you how the root of that word is Greek. So one of the kids is like, okay, Mr. Portopolis, kimono. <laughs> And then he says, kimono. <laughs> and he goes off and explains, I'm not gonna do the whole reenactment, but it's hilarious. You can, you can uh, YouTube it. But he then connects the word kimono to Greek. Okay, so that's what we need to do with the census, okay? <laughs> Give me an issue, any issue, and I will, I will circle it back to the census and why it's important. Do you care about animals? Animal Welfare Act. Do you like nice beaches? Coastal Protection Act. Okay, you like education, you want your kids to go to a good school, funding from public schools. I mean, literally so many issues in our community all circle back to the census. And so I think, you know, in terms of strategies at work, we need to talk to people about what issues you care about, and I'm pretty certain that any of those issues, we can loop it back to census. And so that is the charge that we have. It will take a little extra time, but I really do think it'll make a difference. I think this gets back to Carpe's about framing the issue narrative create a story that matters to us, that, that the media will pick up, that the people in our temple and our churches will care about, and we just have to reframe this. Census is such a sterile, neutral word, but when you talk about things like your children's education, when you talk about uh, someone's health care, when you talk about all these different things that you guys have put up on the screen, we can tie it all the way back to census, because that's where the money comes from. That's how you are counted to actually matter to the government. But uh, how can people get involved? What can they do as a person? <laughs> we can take action right now. So uh, the Census Bureau 
is, uh, and I should be very clear, by the way, the Santa Clara County Office of Education will not be counting people come 2020. We are merely here to bridge the gap between the Federal Census Bureau and the communities here. So there's a lot of miscommunication about who's actually doing the counting. So make sure everyone understands these are federal folks who are doing that, OK? We recently had what's called a point in time count that occurred late, earlier this year. That does not count. Okay, they are going to do their own count of the homeless populations here as well. Okay, anyway, getting involved. Uh, so we had about 77% uh, uh, self-response rate in 2010, back when we didn't have a citizenship question, back when we didn't have these technological issues. Um, we're going to get something a lot lower this time around. So I guess the next question is, so if we got so low, how come we don't have like two seats in Congress? Like what happened? Well. There's this group of folks that come out in the newsletter called the enumerators. And these enumerators are federal uh, workers who are going out to communities, they're knocking on people's doors, and they say, hey, I noticed you didn't fill out the census, would you like to do with me now? And as a result of their work, uh, we got closer to a little bit under a percentage point of, 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 uh, of folks who didn't do counting, okay? That enumerator process is essential to a census count, and we need those enumerators to be from our communities. Because I gotta tell you, if some guy from Texas knocks on my door, I ain't over there. <laughs> right? We need to have community members here who speak our languages, who look like us, who know our, our community best, to be in those positions. And let me tell you what, it pays pretty good. It's $30 an hour. It's a part-time job. So students, I'm looking at you all. If you were looking for a part-time gig, you would then become our census champions. You would be part of this process. I don't have to remind you the census is important. You are doing the census. So a very real way that our communities can get involved now is to make sure that you become an enumerator. If you become an enumerator now, you have three opportunities. You can start as early as this summer with address canvassing. There is then a group quarters count that happens in early 2020, around March, end of March. And then a finally the enumerator count that happens in the, in the summer of 2020. You can do one, two, three, all if you want. Now the thing is, we are only about 30% of what we need for 2020. And that time is growing increasingly short. So if you want to take action now, go to the U.S. Census Bureau's website, you can go to the county website or the Office of the Census, and we have links directly to those jobs. Please get involved now. That's great. I would say, um, just to add on that timeline, so um, it kind of hinted, the census is, you're gonna get that postcard with your PIN number. Um, it's the, the early ones are gonna come around March 23rd. Um, and then Census Day is officially April 1st. So I hope right now you'll all go on your phone and write Census Day um, for that day. And then I hope you'll plan some things. So I, like um, Anne had mentioned, you know, you're gonna post, post your own video, have a community event where you have food, reach out to the, the organizations that you work with already right now, or the, your child's school, or whatever it might be, and start planning for an event right now for, for Census Day. Um, and then I, in addition to being an enumerator, um, I would just encourage you, you know, if you're with an organization that wants to um, put together a project and put together a proposal for funding, I encourage you um, to do that um, with United Way. Um, of course, I, I, I know Anne had just gave, uh, just gave me a number um, of the number of applications they received for their funding, which is, of course, a lot more, like 10 times the amount of funding that they have, but, and, and, and of course we don't have unlimited funding, but I want, please plug in, please, I think that, you know, we're looking for people that want to be engaged, and I think even if you submitted an application, we weren't able to fund your project all the way, we would want to stay connected with you, provide you resources, work with you, make sure you're plugged into all the other places. So, um, in addition to putting your own calendar things, I, I hope you'll put, um, you know, an application in for funding. Yeah, and I think, you know, everyone here as an individual can do something, right? Um, talk to your neighbors, talk to your, you know, people in your church, talk to your people in your schools. I have a meeting um, with our principal at my children's school to make sure that census outreach is a priority, right? So there's things that you can do. Um, hashtag 2020 census is, is the one that's trending. There's going to be a lot of hashtags out there, but use it. Encourage people to, um, you know, uh, use that hashtag and to get the word out. Um, I think it, for those of you who are representing nonprofits, there's work that your own agencies can do as well and apply for funding to be able to do that work. Um, if you're in a position where you can be a funder for the work, we have a pool fund set up at the foundation where we're actually um, continuing to fundraise because we have way more money, more in requests that we can even ma uh, manage. 
we have set up a pooled fund, and one of the things that I'm super excited about, it's been sort of one of the best projects that I've done here at the foundation, is we created this Bay Area Census Funders Collaborative, where we have individual donors, corporations, and foundations that are all donating into this pooled fund with one application process for, for nonprofits. So they don't have to apply to five or six or seven different uh, foundations to get funding. They have one online portal, one place to go, and we just really simplified it. And so uh, if you're in a position to be able to contribute, please contact me because we have um, you know, that fund set up and our goal is to get as much money out as possible to nonprofits because the nonprofits are the ones that are going to be on the ground as the trusted messengers really reaching those hard to count populations. Anne mentioned the citizenship question decision from the Supreme Court is coming um, this month. And so one, just um, you know, being aware of that and, and making sure people are aware that that's coming and hopefully we get a big fat no and we can um, move on. But if it, it does happen, I think there's going to be many opportunities to get more information and get training on how to talk about that and how to um, inform people of their options and what, what it will now look like on the census. So I just wanna encourage you to get that information however you can because it's gonna take all of us um, in communicating about that if that really does get on the census. Yeah, actually there's real concrete steps you can take. So recently, um, we're, this county of the office is, is creating uh, two different versions of a press release, one if things go really badly, one if things go not as badly. <laughs> uh, so we're actually uh, planning on having a press conference. We'd love all of you to be there. I think, Karthi, we're talking about showing up, right? And, and proving that the AAPI community is behind uh, immigrants and immigrant issues. I think this is our key opportunity. So put your money where your mouth is, right? Uh, the decision is set out to be uh, uh, released any Monday, 17th or 24th, uh, but it could be any day in between. So we will be acting very quickly, uh, given the fact that the decision is to be rendered on the East Coast. So we're thinking about like a, like a 10 o'clock thing. So we'll be sending that out to organizations. We'd love to have you there. We really want to show a unified front for immigrants here in this county. Uh, I'll turn it over now to Carter to kind of gel us all together after <laughs> getting out of this panel. So much here. No, it's been a treat uh, to, and especially, you know, thinking about our region too. And, and in many ways, it's um, similar things. I think the resources here are greater than we have. So for us, actually, the state money is greater than the private philanthropy money, and so is money to the community foundations that we have. I'll just lift up a few um, few themes. Um, and it's, you know, just to, to, I think on the one hand, it's, it's complicated, but on the other hand, it's very simple. Right? It's complicated in the sense that we absolutely need to have everyone engaged and involved. We also, we have to be consistently reassure people, right, that this information will not be used against them, even if we do not trust this administration on so many other things. And that is that so that makes it really complicated. That sounds like a mixed message. And by the way, I'm gonna put this out there because I, I can't tell you on social media how many times I've seen this. There's been this Washington Post story talking about Japanese American internment and how census records were used for internment, right? Muslim populations today have similar kinds of concerns, but any anyone who's wary of government records and what it can be used for. And so I'll lift back some of the themes that said is that you have actors that are trying to erase us, they're trying to turn the clock back, and they're trying to make communities, entire communities, invisible not only now, but for the next 10 years. And so we cannot let them in. Right? So it is an act of resistance. Now for some people, an act of resistance gets exhausting. It's been going on for like three years now. Right? So, uh, and I'm not, by the way, I'm no party person. <laughs> Deliberately so, because I run surveys and I don't want to have kind of a biting interest in these elections. But Kamala Harris had this quote, or this, uh, this expression, I think she said on the Ellen Show, which I thought was appealing, which is this notion of a happy warrior, right? We want to have fun. This needs to be fun. We need to kind of pace ourselves. Between now and like June of 2020, it's like a marathon, right? So, but we do need to have fun, right? In terms of, first of all, food, and just, <laughs> Finding kind of ways, finding meaning, right? So I would say, try to, we need to get creative in terms of how we engage, but also realize 
that is a battle. By the way, just last week, news broke that the citizenship question was part of a deliberate plan to improve white male Republican representation. It was on this lawyer, strategist, our drive after he died, his daughter happened to find it, and, they, and it might not affect the Supreme Court decision, but it is actually a battle that's out there. The, the stage has been set, and yes, it could be exhausting, but I think especially for people in this room that have the privilege to fight, to fight not only on behalf of ourselves, but others in our community that don't have that bandwidth and capacity to do it, like we need to suit up for battle for the next year. And we need to be these happy warriors. One final thing I'll say is just we need to make it personal. And I would say I'm privileged in some ways with this, but think about this, and maybe this is something that we can think of meaningful swag, and I'll tell you why. This is about uh, 15 years ago, my grandfather had died, right? So I was, I'm an immigrant from India, and we were just going through his stuff, and I saw he had this medallion, and it was a 1941 census commemorator medallion that he had, and that was so meaningful. Right, to see that. So that's something I think we can think about. Of course, we, are, we live in this fully digital world, but if we can come up with the, the kind of swag that will be meaningful, that you can tell your children and your grandchildren that you were part of something important to make sure that we have America live up to its ideals rather than like this very narrow notion of who we are, and that you were part of that battle, you're part of that fight and we prevailed and that would be a good thing. So I think we should prepare. Uh, we're gonna open up to a QA session, but before we do it, but to that point of like the, the battle, we're sitting right now in a meeting called Fair Yesa in San Jose. Prior to the 2010 redistricting, this was split into four distinct assembly districts. Because there was an elected official that said, I don't want another Asian in my district, and it disenfranchised the API community in this region. But now, at post redistricting, because of the 2010 census, there is one district represented in this area, and that's the seven member camp in Chisholm we heard from earlier today. But that's the, that's the type of tactics that, other, that people are trying to disenfranchise communities, whether it be API, whether it be Latinx, whether it be Black, whether it be the Muslim population. Our goal is to have an accurate count, and then from there, the redistricting commission can look at who is who lives where? How can we maintain seven and not dividing up political power? So this is a very real topic to this region and to this very specific geographic region. And so we, we do have to fight, but we should be happy warriors. And you know, things like the fundings that are coming from the different funders, think about what can we do at the church? Maybe we get the food out there. And that's what some of the money can be used for to entertain that. But so think creatively. What can you do in your neighborhood? Next door app. Normally, it's a lot of people complaining. Maybe you can use it to actually get people to come to your home, and you can host some people over to do a census call. But those are some uh, some things that you can just start thinking about. Any questions from the audience? I have a comment. Mm -hmm. You're talking about the Happy Warrior. I am founder of American Muslim Voice Foundation, and we have been Happy Warriors for a long time, especially the last three, two years since Trump has been here. We bring people together to share our religion and culture. So we share our culture and religion, and we have been providing Muslim experience to our fellow Americans, so they make up their mind who Muslims are, not the administration, not the media. So it can be done. If anybody wants to know how, I volunteer for that. We just had 275 people registered to come to my home for iftar dinner on 28th May. It was freezing cold and it was going to rain, so I had to cancel that. But now people have been asking me when I'm going to set up the makeup thing. You just gave me an idea, I'm gonna make that a census party. <laughs> So much, there's uh, so much information out there. Are you going to set up a site where we can all, all go there and uh, 
share this information because I put down at least 25 different things that I learned today. So if I can go to one place and learn it at one place, that would be appreciated. I guess so me listing five websites won't be helpful. Uh, I, <laughs> but your, the county is, is probably the best place right now. Um, I know each county is making their own website and, and grabbing resources from the Bureau, from the state. Um, we're hoping to do something similar, but I'll let Nick talk about his website. Uh, I think, you know, that's the, the hardest part about all this is there is so much information. I mean, here with the Bureau, we'd probably say, hey, come to our website. The state would be like, you should see our website. We have a million things on there. So I guess it depends on what you're looking for, but I, I agree. I mean, with Kelly, you know, we are all working in partnerships, so a lot of the materials you see on her side are also going to be on ours, you know, what's in the foundations, it's going to be on, on the United Ways. We're all working together to have all that information. If you're thinking about your, your or here, your residents, your populations here in Santa Clara County, we'd love you to come to our website, come to our meetings, because we are focusing our efforts here locally. Uh, there's a lot of me messages that work other places, but we're working for our communities here. Yeah, definitely make a list about the water at ccgov.org. But no, they have an amazing resource there, and they're a team of three, but if you need them to come to your organization to come give an overview, something like this that we just did right now, they view those type of presentations also. So that's you don't have to know it yourself, you can have them come out to you. Any other questions? How many?
from civic engagement that being asked is the strongest determinant of people getting involved. So it's the, it's the kind of thing in which, and I, and I hate to paraphrase someone who I don't respect, but you're gonna have so much census that you're gonna get sick of census, right? <laughs> so much money. You're gonna get sick of it by the time you right? But in addition to the institutional actors, you know, like the auntie who commands you to get involved, I love that. Like, <laughs> Like the kind of informal power in our communities, right? Say, you are doing this, and I'm watching. Uh, my name is Flor de Leon, and I'm um, coming from the organization Somos Mayfair. We are more in the east side of San Jose, and we have a lot of things that we're working on with affordable housing and in the education system, educating parents, parents to be leaders in their community and have a voice. And, um, I'm so happy to be here, you know, I'm, when I came here, I didn't have an idea what, what I was coming to. My organization just said, you know what, they're inviting us. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, yes, I want to go because I, you know, I, I want to get as much information. But uh, talking about the census, I have here in our meetings with people that are saying, we need to work on this. We need to make this as a priority. And I think... Uh, we need to work hard to make sure that everyone is count, you know? And I just wanna share with you guys, I've been living here in the United States since 1993, and I have never been counting the census, you know? Never, I have never experienced someone coming to my door or anything, and until now that I learned, every 10 years you're counted, and if you're not counted, you know? And all the challenges that we have with our communities because people have fear, uh, and they don't wanna, they wanna be high. I, I know people been here illegal for more than 30 years. They lose family members. They, they, they have never gone back to their country. And it's, it's I think what, um, Kartik, what's your name? Kartik. Kartik. Kartik mentioned, it's very important to take that message, you know, and be creative. Because sometimes we don't, I think seeing the, the new generations here gives, gives us that hope that in the future, you know, they are gonna handle it in a better way. Mm. And we should lose that fear. We should, we should show that. We should show that we, we, we're not gonna go with, with saying, you know, you, it, it might happen because like you say, sometimes even the government, because the government has that information and might use it against us, but, if we've been in the shadow for over 30 years, you know, and, and you still here in the shadows, are you gonna stay like that for how many more years? Maybe you're gonna die. We don't, we don't know. Maybe you're gonna die tomorrow, but I think this is, a, a, I like what you say, you know, this is a life for silence. This is something that we're gonna have to take it personal, and uh, I'm gonna take back to my organization, and I'm sure my organization will wanna work on this, and I hope I get your information on the grants that you have to be able to, to take it back to our club and have a, a group of women that can help with this and, and bring it to the community. Thank you. So the next office actually does have a Spanish speaking staff that can do presentations in Spanish as well. Hi, my name is Gabriel and I am uh, East High School Board Trustee. I have a suggestion that uh, a lot of uh, minority group may not be aware of census, but I think if you can launch uh, the ethnic um, media uh, to send the message out, along with those political officials, those community leaders in the community, so they can build a trust, because if they come out, and send the message out to the, their own community, people will be likely to trust them more than the government. So I think it's uh, another message that if you can send out, reach out to those ethnic media uh, and uh, invite those uh, political officials or community leaders and talk about it and also involve in the uh, community events such like uh, I'm also involved in community a lot of like the Moon Festival or New Year's. Uh, tech festival, Chinese festival, um, you know, all of those India festival, I mean, so many community are here, but I know that they don't have a lot of funding, but pick some that very dominant and also involve 
you know, with those uh, community leaders. That's my suggestion. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Tweety Nguyen, president of Foothill College. I'm just curious whether there's a coalition of higher education. I think it seems rather light, not only as workers over 18 uh, doing outreach, but potentially having these types of parties and students actually helping to fill out the forms for our family members and considering the digital uh, literacy of students today too. So is there such a coalition? Has there been in the past, 2010, et cetera? Uh, so I, I don't know about 2010, but Dr. Duan and I have, uh, we have meetings with the steering committee where she sits. Um, so the education subcommittee group, which I had mentioned before, is a subcommittee of the coalition of different partners within that field to discuss outreach strategies uh, for education. Now, it could always get bigger. And, and I think, you know, Olivia, who's actually uh, also part of that subcommittee, could, could talk to you more about getting involved. And I think we want to continue those organizations. I mean, that's the thing. Uh, like Edward said, I'm a, we're offers of three people. So we know, we know a lot of people, and I would like to say that after today, my family has grown. I have more <laughs> friends. But we need more people to open those doors for us. Any last questions, Thomas? Hi, good afternoon. I wanted to know around the grant applications. Um, you know, a lot of the nonprofit organizations that we work with in our office are smaller and not have the, the capacity of a bigger organization. And some of the RFPs, grant applications, are pretty complicated and they require a lot of, you know, um, things that we need to do and. Uh, performance evaluations. How can we make sure that the smaller nonprofit organizations have the opportunity to apply and get the grants themselves? Because they are the ones that really work with the community and the, the people that they serve with the smaller Heart Cal Foundation. I would just say that um, I know even talking to Anne, I think I maybe met you at a meeting in, in January and that was on your mind in terms of making the grants accessible to smaller nonprofits with and not so many restrictions or administrative burden or even just the application process being too much of a burden. So um, I think the funders, I'm hoping some of the organizations that you're talking about actually already applied for, for the funders collaborative, but in terms of ours, I tried to, I mostly tried to model ours uh, similar questions. So if you already wrote the answer for the funders collaborative, you're not rewriting it and rethinking it for us. Uh, but also, you know, our money is state money, so there, I, I, there's some that's unavoidable, but we've done our best to, you know, create some templates, create some, uh, we're gonna have someone in-house that's gonna manage data and the, the reporting, and, you know, they're gonna be providing technical assistance and make it easier on, your, on the teams of these organizations, so that knowing that not everyone has the capacity, and, and then I would also encourage collaboratives, like if someone can apply on behalf and, you know, Bring, make you stronger together. Um, you know, maybe an organization that does have the capacity partners with an organization that doesn't. So um, that, know that that's been on our mind, um, knowing that the smallest organizations that are working with some populations that um, may not be coming to other larger things, um, those are the organizations we want to work with. So we've been mindful about that from the start. Uh, just as an example of that, when after we applied for some of the funding, we worked with the Vietnamese American Roundtable and the Filipino to form a collaborative. So there's options out there because, again, not to say that they're smaller, but then, you know, they don't have necessarily have bandwidth, so we took on the bandwidth as an organization, and so we can subgrant out. So I know there's, there's, you're looking into whether you can subgrant on United Way at this point, but there's definite funding coming from the, the county that is specifically set aside for CBOs, for community-based organization, nonprofits. So know there are pools of money. Talk to people, network here today. If there's ways that you can collaborate with other people here today, that way, most of the money can then actually go to people and not necessarily overhead, per se. But, so, there's ways to create networks here today. So, I, I do want to clear, clarify one thing before we go. So, the citizenship question, nobody likes it, I don't like it, and we want it all. But, you know, the American Community Survey, which actually hosts that question right now, and the way they're thinking of modeling the question, it does not ask you if you are undocumented currently. It asks you, are you a citizen or are you not a U.S. citizen, okay? So make sure that our communities also understand that we are not listening, that we are undocumented on that, on that particular question, okay? Now, it still sucks and we want it off, but 
make sure that when we're moving forward that we're not causing undue panic around what the census is actually doing in our communities, that we are actually informing everyone correctly about everything that's actually happening. Well, actually on that, I'll just clarify. So the ACS question, it's a larger response set, right? So it's whether, it's a combination of nativity and citizenship. Right, right. It says if you're from, if you're born in the United States, or if you naturalize, what year? Yeah, basically, it's yes, born in the United States, yes, born in Puerto Rico or another right. territory, uh, yes, naturalized, and then finally, no, not a U.S. citizen. Right. So, and this is where there'll be, it's very likely because it's going to be digital first. We don't know, but likely that you will probably not be able to submit that form as a complete census enumeration because they have that control. When it was paper, you would have a bunch of data, maybe with missing values, that then you would need to figure out what to deal with that. But anyway, I think there's all, there's all sorts of things coming down the pipe, but the thing I would say, this is something that is, it's, it's part of a sample that's sent to the US household that we rely on for information. I mean, as a, as a data person, you know, I would say that this can actually be useful information course in the wrong hands. It's not that they're going to come after you individually. This is where actually it's for some of the voting rights work. Conservatives would love to be able to draw districts that, ex that exclude non-citizens. That, that's actually part of the plan. The long-term evil plan. But ultimately though, we have to, again, it's the happy warrior thing. If they're going to be, if they're going to try to exclude us and, and exclude regions, I mean this is also part of a ploy to make California weaker compared to other states. Regions in California that have larger immigrant populations weaker to, with respect to other regions that we can't make up. Yeah. So let's give a round of applause to this panel.